Now let's get some additional perspective on the prisoner swap. Nick Schifrin has that. Nick? Jeff, to discuss the larger implications of today's events, we turn to Andrew Weiss. He's a former State Department official who served in the George H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations and is now the Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thanks very much, Andrew Weiss. Welcome back. Great to be here. To the news hour. As we just showed a few minutes ago, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin at the end of Pride in Time welcomed home all these Russian spies and their families on a big red carpet, big flowers. What message is he sending? So Vladimir Putin goes to great lengths to wrap himself in the valor of the Russian security establishment. But all of that covers up a pretty unpleasant and embarrassing fact, which is that Russian spies have been arrested all over the world or caught red-handed doing bad stuff, including the uh, hitman in the Berlin uh, case, uh, Vadim Krasikov. Right. So, you know, what Vladimir Putin is doing by putting on such a big show is covering up, frankly, for the continued underperformance of his security establishment and acting like they're big heroes. They're screw-ups. They're not heroes. Hmm. Um, as I reported earlier, the U.S. Uh, offered two different trades uh, before today uh, for Whelan by himself and then Whelan, Revan Gershkovich, including those two Russian so-called illegal sleeper agents uh, had, that had been caught in Slovenia. But both were rejected, and the message that the U.S. got was, call us back when we have Krasikov. So why is Krasikov so important to Putin? So there's indications that they know each other personally. The Wall Street Journal has a wonderful long piece that appeared uh, sometime today that says they potentially worked together back when Vladimir Putin was the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg in the 1990s. So this is a career Russian intelligence operative who's presumably conducted a variety of assassinations and targeted killings in various parts of the world, including in Moscow. Um, and who claims to have gone to shooting ranges and done other things with Vladimir Putin personally. So there seems to be a connection between the two men, the, the two men rather. And you saw when he came down the, the uh, jetway today at the airport of Moscow, Vladimir Putin hugged him. And, and you and I have talked uh, multiple times about how the different parts of the national security apparatus in Russia often fight each other. Could there also be a dispute within the intelligence agencies inside of Russia over who to release? And, and would the FSB, uh, Putin being a former KGB colonel, would the FSB win that fight? So Russia has a sprawling national security apparatus, which is big by design. It's intended to kind of avoid power consolidating in any corner so that Vladimir Putin can kind of divide and rule. But what we've seen, rather than, you know, the Russian security establishment backing away from confrontation with the West, is leaning in. And so we've seen reports of the Russian intelligence services trying to assassinate the CEO of a senior German defense manufacturer. We've seen them conduct sabotage operations. When Vladimir Putin says he's at war with the West, I think we need to take him at his word. Why would Putin agree to this deal now, three months before the U.S. election, instead of waiting? Vladimir Putin is... Uh, a cold-blooded operator who is tactical and who believes in being transactional. So for him to get what he thinks is a pretty good deal, for ages they've been pushing to get the, the hitman in the Berlin case uh, released. This is a person who is serving a life sentence for conducting a murder, a targeted killing in broad daylight. So for them, this is a good deal. And if you look at the other Russians who are coming out of detention, these are people who the Russians wanted back, who were uh, intelligence operatives that have been rolled up in Poland and Norway and in Slovenia, as well as people conducted in U.S. courts. But what is, you know, all these debates about a deal come down to are the numbers, and the counting game is really complicated. So U.S. officials today are at pains to say we're getting 16 people out and the Russians are getting eight back. So, it, it you know, it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And yet Putin did not release other Americans, as Jeff was just highlighting, uh, Mark Fogel uh, uh, included. Why might he withhold some of them? They're bargaining chips. So there are other Russians that they want back. There are people that the Russians will continue to uh, roll, uh, take into detention. Any American who's foolish enough to go to visit Russia, even for family reasons, is at risk. Uh, President uh, Biden today made a point of that in saying the underlying message of today's good news is also that people need to steer clear of travel to dangerous destinations like Russia. And quickly, in the moments we have left, you've had an extensive career in government. How complicated 
would it have been to coordinate all the European countries and all the U.S. agencies and Russian intelligence to get this deal? I'm glad you brought that up. That's what's truly unprecedented about today's news. It's a multidimensional problem. It wasn't just negotiated between the United States and Russia. The German role was absolutely critical because, as you've pointed out, that was the key demand from the Russian side. So without the German support, this deal would not have come together. And then you had lesser roles played by our allies. Andrew Weiss, thanks very much. Jeff, back to you.